Welcome to this video series about improvising by Sietse de Vries. You can support this video series by donating the amount of your choice to Sietse de Vries' Patreon account, which can be found by searching Sietse de Vries Patreon or by finding the link in the description below the video. Enjoy the video. All right, let's get started. And before I start talking about improvisation, it's probably a good idea to introduce you to the room we're in at the moment, um, because I'm planning on doing a lot of the videos from this room. This is called my church house. I was uh, very fortunate to be able to buy a little village church in 2009. And during the years, this turned into a wonderful place to live with my family. But also, this music room where we are in at the moment uh, turned into kind of a little paradise. And uh, yeah, there are lots of different instruments. So let's have a look around. I will just pick up the camera. Let's start at the north side of the church. Here you can see a very nice one manual harpsichord, a copy after Mietke, a German builder. Then we see a wonderful Regal, a very special instrument. Then a two manual harpsichord in French style. Then quite a large reed organ uh, built by the firm Holt Birmingham. Then we have the main organ of the church, a wonderful organ case. Uh, this organ started its life in 1906. The organ builder made a beautiful baroque organ case, uh, but then it was only a small organ, 10 stops, one manual pull-down pedals, and in the meantime it turned into a big organ in baroque style with 22 stops, Hauptwerk, Oberwerk and pedal. Another reed organ, a French harmonium from Alexandre, then we are at the south side of the church, an oven, lots of books, and yes, indeed, I am the nerdy organist, so most of the books are about organs, composers, music in general. And then the west end of the church, we have a nice little virginal, a beautiful little chamber organ from Scotland. And for romantic music, a beautiful Hill and Sun organ from 1874. And this is the organ I'm going to work with today, an organ in Renaissance style, mean tone temperament. So I will set the camera down here and then we can get started. All right, uh, let's begin with a famous statue. Uh, most organ lovers will definitely know it. It's the statue of César Franck, the famous organ composer from Paris. And uh, this statue is sitting outside his church in Paris, and you can see César Franck sitting at his organ, and an angel comes down and whispers wonderful ideas in his ear. And I suppose that is how most people think about improvisation. It's for the special people that have an angel or some extra creativity or a special brain. But I hope to show to you that that's not true at all. Actually, my message to you is that everyone can improvise. And I will also tell you why. It actually started uh, my research about this when I was a student in Groningen at the conservatory where I teach now. And as a student it really puzzled me that for me the normal way of music making was just sitting down on a keyboard instrument and have fun. Whatever tune I had in my head or whatever tune I was given I could have fun with and, and make music. And I discovered that most of my fellow students didn't do that. They actually didn't understand it. 
And without their books, they were lost. They were totally score dependent. And of course, as you probably know, it's about 99% of all musicians. They're totally score dependent. Without books, without notes, there's no music at all. At best, you can just reproduce by heart a piece that you studied, but that's basically it. Then I did another discovery when I started studying about my great heroes like César Franck, like Bach, like Buxtehude, uh, like all the famous composers, I discovered that for them the normal way of music making was also improvising, not playing pieces. For example, if you read up about Bach, he would just play an organ uh, using a hymn, uh, a theme that he got. Uh, very famous is, of course, the story about Johann Adam Reinken, who heard him improvise. Uh, but also the story of uh, the musical offering, where Bach got a theme from the king and he would improvise all night on that theme. And he was so happy with it that he decided to turn it into a composition. But almost every composition started its life as an improvisation. So now the question is, what is different? In earlier days, all the main composers, all the main musicians were able to improvise. What happened during the way that we lost that ability? And it's not an answer for me that we are different in the 21st century. I don't believe that. We are still the same people. And then it hit me actually, it's all about how do you start making music? And that's the big secret actually. And therefore, uh, this video series is not only for people that want to improvise, um, it's actually for three different categories, you could say. It's for the people that already improvise and want to improve. It's for people that want to start to improvise. So I will start at the very bottom, at a real simple level. But it's also, and that's at least as important, for you to start thinking about teaching. How do you start with children? Because that's the main secret. And I discovered during the years that all my colleagues that can improvise had the same thing in common. They all started playing a keyboard instrument just for fun. Without any lessons, they just fooled around on the keyboard. They would play whatever came to mind and only later they started having the regular lessons. And what's the secret here? Well, if I compare it to speaking a language, it becomes completely clear. Because what's the normal way of learning your native language? As a small child, already as a baby, you start listening. That's the first step. Second step is you start copying small words. I mean, every mom and dad is totally proud when a child starts saying mommy and daddy and other small words. Then you start giving meaning to the words and you start speaking small sentences. And only after a child is already capable of communicating in that language and, well, capable of doing quite something in that language, then you go to school and you start reading and writing. That's the natural order of things. Now, if we translate this to music, we do the total opposite. We start from lesson one with reading. I think that most of you who watch these videos have the same experience. Your first organ or piano lesson would be that a teacher gives you a book and explains to you, if you see this little symbol here in the book, you have to press this key and then music appears. You don't know why, but that's what happens. And that's how you train score-dependent musicians. It has to do with the way you learn music. What should be the right way? Well, it all starts with singing. That's what every child loves to do. And I don't know how it is in your country, but in the Netherlands, it's actually quite bad. A lot of children don't sing anymore. But that's step one. You need songs. You need music in your head, in your mind. Once you can sing some tunes, you can translate that to a keyboard. You can play something. And that's, of course, how you start with children. You just take a song that everyone knows and you start finding the right keys to play it. But then the second step, already quite fast, is actually harmonizing. So that's why I want to start uh, today. And keep in mind, I start at the simplest level, but even for people that already improvise or are professional musicians, it's important to follow this all the way through. Because it's, it, well, it has two advantages. The one advantage is that you really discover what, what do I really know? And the second thing, which is even more important, is how can I teach this material to young children, to students? And of course, not only to young children, because if you take the comparison with a language again, 
your native language is always the language you master completely. So for me, that is improvising. Uh, that, that's for me a native language because I did it from small child on. And of course, everyone who listens to this video can tell that uh, that the English language is not my native tongue. But still, I can speak it, I can learn it, and you can understand me. And that's the same with improvising. Uh, at all ages, it really doesn't matter how old you are, you can still learn it. But the problem is that you probably don't get as good as it as a native speaker, so to say. So, but that shouldn't in, uh, discourage you because you can still learn a lot. Uh, I mean, if I would live for five years in England, for example, I would probably be pretty good at English because I have to speak it every day with native speakers. And it's the same with improvising, you just have to do it a lot. Well, let's get started. The first thing that everyone should know about a keyboard is actually not what you learn from the books. Like you have a little symbol and then you have to place your hands a certain way and move your fingers. The first thing that every child should know is that the keyboard is ridiculously simple. It's only one octave and it repeats all the time. If you want to go down uh, lower notes, it's here. If you want to go up, it's there. It, it's so easy, actually. And of course, the keyboard is actually designed to play triads. Because, well, as you probably know from music history, it all started in the Gothic times with fifths and after a while they discovered that thirds are beautiful too, and of course those are the normal harmonics. And they discovered that a triad is a beautiful sound. And that's actually how they designed the keyboards, that you can easily play triads. So every child from, let's say, five, six, seven years on can easily play a triad. So let's say that you already uh, had step one, that a child can play a few nice melodies, and let's take a very simple melody that is still internationally no known, uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, so... And it really doesn't matter in the beginning with what fingers you play something, that, that all comes later. First, having fun and understanding the keyboard. Then the first step should actually be, what is a triad of C? And what can you do with a triad? You can invert it, so the C goes on top, and you get this. The next step is, of course, the second inversion. And then we're back at the beginning, in root position. So the first thing that you should learn on the keyboard is just invert triads. And you start with the triad of C, but then you can do the same with the triad of F and of G. And then, for all that already know the musical theory, then you can harmonize with the root, the subdominant and the dominant, which I always call the 1-4-5 system. So you only have to use the triads of C, of F and G with all the inversions, and then you can harmonize most songs. Of course, a problem can be that children, when they don't sing anymore, you don't have that much material. So Twinkle Twinkle Little Star is a good beginning, but it's very difficult actually to come up with five or ten other melodies that you can use. So when the child doesn't know any other melodies that are suitable for using the system, start singing with them. And of course that's different from earlier days. For Bach that wouldn't be a problem because all the children sung church melodies in school. So they all would know all the famous hymns, Ein feste Burg, Allein Gott in der Höse Ehr. Those were songs that every child knew from very early on. But let's start with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So the melody is on top and you just make sure that you use the triad of C, F or G to harmonize it. That means the right hand plays something like this. And for, especially for professional organists actually, it's also a nice exercise to discover do you really have control over your fingers? Because most organists are trained in a romantic way that they have substitute fingering all the time. So when they play a chord, they would already shift their fingers 
to play the next chord. But here it's very important to first picture the melody and the chord and then you play it without any extra movement of the fingers. So very quietly. Of course the left hand uh, can do something as well, so it only plays the notes of the triad, so the root. Always a C, an F or a G. And if you add those notes you actually get a very nice harmonization of the song. Imagine every child is capable of playing this in one week. So that's quite a difference from coming home after your first piano or organ lesson and doing all these exercises that sound dull and they don't recognize a melody, there's not really a nice song in it very often, it's just technical practicing. And here suddenly they can play a song that they can sing and they can harmonize it and it really sounds like organ music already. And you can actually take it one step further by already using the different manuals if you have that at home and the pedals, why not? If the child can reach the pedal, you can also play the three bass notes in the pedal. That's actually great fun. And we will talk about it more in the next lesson, how you can really explore the possibilities of an organ. Because that's one of the things that comes natural when you improvise, you really get to know the instrument. So you know exactly how to use stops and how to use the different manuals and how to make good sounds because you're only using your ears, your inner hearing to make music and you're not distracted by all the information that you have to look at. Because that's the main difference between people that improvise and score dependent musicians. They just look at a piece of paper that gives them information, it goes to their brain and immediately it's translated to the fingers and they start moving and then you have music. When you improvise you use a much bigger part of your brain because you have to consider in what key am I, what's the melody, which triads am I going to use and you have to make all these decisions in a split second and then you start playing, that's actually the last thing. So that is, that's also why it is so important to take your time to really think through things and then you start playing. It has nothing to do with being virtuose and making big impressions. That, that can all come later if you are interested in that kind of thing. You want to understand what you do. Control is really my main secret. If you control what you do, then you can really learn how to improvise. So this is step one and of course you can use different tunes. Um, and in the Netherlands we still sing a lot of Genevan songs and some of them are really well suited for using this kind of harmonization. For example Psalm 93, let me give you the, the melody and the harmonization, it, it's like this. Two important things about this, you probably saw that I sometimes switch from a chord. So for example if there is a G in the melody I can use the triad of G but also the triad of C. When I have a C in the melody I can use of course the triad of C but also the triad of F major. So you already have something to choose. And second, uh, some people will immediately say well there are parallel chords in here, that's horrible. True. 
But the thing is, like a language, when a small child starts speaking a language, it will make mistakes. The past tense and difficult things like that, they are not right from the beginning. And it doesn't matter because the more um, you, you speak the language and the more elaborate uh, and eloquent you can speak different words, the better it gets. So we really don't worry about parallels in the beginning. So even if you are already a professional organist and you want to try this, don't worry about parallels. It will all go away after a while. Well, some other hymn tunes that you can use, uh, especially from the German tradition, we have a lot of wonderful hymn tunes like this one. <laughs> the part that follows now has an interesting change in key but you can use it and actually it's interesting to see if a child wants to harmonize it what happens because then it has to find a solution for the problem but of course you can use so many different uh, hymn tunes we also have the, the famous one that Bach uses a lot the <laughs> the famous Freudig Seer O Meine Seele. Or maybe there are some children's songs that you can use that's different in every country, of course. And you noticed I used already different keys, and that's something you can do quite soon from the beginning. You start in C major, so that uh, the student really knows C, F and G, the triads. But then it's of course only a small step to discover, okay, I can play in F major, and then 1 is F, 4 is B flat, 5 is C. And in G we have G is 1, C is 4, and D is 5. And then you also can explain already a little bit about the F sharp and the B flat, how that works. And actually a child will discover it uh, on its own probably that something doesn't sound right and that you have to use a black key. And that's actually good because that's the way to learn. You just experience something and then you decide, okay, if I do this, then it sounds good. And then you really understand what you're doing. And that's completely different from learning from a book because that will just tell you, okay, if you see this little sign uh, with a hashtag and then suddenly you use a black key and you have no idea why, but you just do whatever is on the paper. So this is the way you can start. So good luck with that. Just use different melodies. You can also use a melody uh, of your own uh, as long as you can use it with the 145 system. And of course, very important, the first step is knowing that melody by heart. You should be able to sing it and then you start harmonizing, always in that order. So don't put a paper in front of someone with the melody because then they again start looking at the paper like, oh, herein lies my salvation or something. No, it's all in the mind. Ears should be the main tool to work with. All right, so far for the first lesson, uh, good luck with it. And next time we talk more about how to use the different triads. <laughs>